I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And you know, it's all about the neighborhood. This is a conversation about how we build our community, our neighborhood, house by house, family by family. We're focusing on business creation, business development, economic development, and culture. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. Today's program is a special one. It's the beginning of a series that focuses on what it means to have a vision of possibility in community. And for that, I have a special thanks to the sponsor for today's program, U.S. Bank. And here from U.S. Bank is Greg Cunningham. He's Vice President and Head of Diversity and Inclusion at U.S. Bank. His mission is to make diversity and inclusion a business imperative for the company and to inspire other companies, other brands to do so. So Greg, we're gonna have a great conversation today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your sponsorship. Uh, you use the tagline, community possible. Mm. What does that mean for US Bank? What does it mean for Greg Cunningham? Well, um, I'll talk about what it means for me first. And you talked about my role at US Bank, Al, and I really feel like um, leading um, global inclusion and diversity for U.S. Bank. It wasn't a role that I chose. Um, I like to tell people it was a role that chose me. Um, as you know, uh, from the time we've known each other, I'm a marketer by trade. And when I came to the bank, I was in a marketing role, um, but I was so tired of all of the, the things that were happening around me, and I was just tired of Facebooking and tweeting about it, and I wanted to be part of the solution um, and actually get involved in the work. Um, to move our community forward. And so this, this, this role really appealed to me in that way. And so Community Possible is really an extension of our core values as an organization. Um, as I like to tell people about diversity and inclusion, it's not a problem that we're trying to solve, it's a way that we need to be. Um, it's a way that we need to be as an organization, as a community, um, and as individuals. And so Community Possible was our way of really sort of um, organizing our philanthropy around three principles. And those principles were work, home, and play. And home is, is everything around the American dream, right? It, it's everything from owning your first home, um, you know, having an affordable um, housing uh, programs, those sorts of things. Play is everything around you know, communities and how communities organize around culture and having safe places to play for kids so that they can um, further their education. Uh, the one that I'm most passionate about um, is the work um, pillar. Because uh, work is everything around um, supporting um, entrepreneurship and, and small business and workforce development and financial education um, and all of those things. So Community Possible is really about helping all of our stakeholders, whether they be employees, customers, or communities, to reach your full potential. So you mentioned work. Uh, that's important to you. It's important to me. And I think the other colleagues at the table are gentlemen who know all about work. Uh, Richard Copeland is the founder and CEO of Thor Companies. Owner, not CEO. <laughs> Owner. Yeah. Owner. I of, think you know our CEO. I do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Ravi, right. Owner and chairman, <laughs> properly. You. Yes. Yeah. And uh, But you and Ravi are a great team, uh, great businessmen, great community leaders, great thinkers. And uh, also at the table right now is Houston White. His company is HWMR, formerly uh, Houston White or H. White Men's Room, more than a barbershop. Much more than a barbershop. Um, you know, if you ask 10, if you poll 10 black folks, what are th the three of the most important spaces in the black community? Grandma's house, uh, a religious institution, and probably the barbershop. That's a good yeah. one. That's a good phrase. And, you yeah. know, we, we've tried to use that, that community center and kind of create a mecca of community development, especially for millennials and young adults. So I want to have this conversation to talk about how we reshape the image, create a new narrative about what community means. Uh, talk about community possible. And Richard, I said to you before the program that uh, when I drive by the corner of Plymouth and Penn, that's my neighborhood, I live three blocks from there, so I'm by there 10 times a day, every day. And where there used to be a vacant lot, which before that, there was a McDonald's. Yeah, I remember that, it well. It didn't work. Uh, but now a phenomenal new structure is arising and it's going to be the headquarters for Thor. Two stories. One is I was driving by one day and a brother on a bicycle, a friend of mine, said, Al, Al, 
look at this, look at this. He was excited, agitated. And I said, yeah, what's up, man? He said, this is like the pyramids, <laughs> the pyramids. And so what you're doing is capturing the imagination of our people. But then I can tell you that when I drive by, and even the past few days, Richard, I had the same feeling that I had when I first saw the African American History Museum in Washington, D.C. Wow. That's a phenomenal, monumental, life-changing, game-changing structure. I think your headquarters on Plymouth and Penn is a game-changing structure for our community as well. Tell me about the background. Well, thank you for the acknowledgement, Al, but uh, time and time again when I'm over there, we get that kind of acknowledgement from people on the street, people huddled against the fence. My husband's working there. Happy. Yeah, yeah, and I'm so proud of him mm -hmm. building the structure in our community. And just a matter of fact, yesterday, a truck driver was in my office saying he delivered some of the precast panels for the facade of the building. And he's saying, you know, that's an African-American that owns that building, building that building. And how proud he was. He was telling all the other truck drivers about it. And so it, 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 it elicits this, this sense of pride mm -hmm. and community far beyond our wildest dream. So there's a basis, though. You've got a story of uh, just relentless work. And you didn't just happen stance upon this, right? You worked for it. <coughs> What's your me. personal story, your background? You're a North Side guy. Well, yeah, was, uh, but before I do, to, excuse me, to, to, to um, excuse me, Greg's point of, about work. We spend so much time at work. It's like the center of my existence. You know, of course, then the barber shop. I grew up at the barber shop. Running errands for Mr. Watson, uh, going down the corner, uh, getting him uh, whatever he wanted, but he, just to get a nickel. Uh, and then, of course, church. And so those are the pillars. And work is the, the, the mainstay of our existence and the, the people we interact with. Mm -hmm. But my story, uh, uh, it's kind of a well-known a well story, that I was born in the projects, uh, Sumner Olson, to a single mom, probably 100 yards from where I live right now in Heritage Park. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't gotten very far. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I, I've, I've been moving, but just haven't gone very far. Uh, and, and so then, uh, I'm born there, and then um, uh, um, grew up over south, um, on, um, 39th in Oakland, and um, uh, then 44th and 5th, and then uh, uh, moved back to the north side as, a, as an adult, and I've lived there uh, ever since. So um, um, it, it's, it's a it's kind of a rags to riches story, uh, <laughs> more, much more rags than riches. Uh, <laughs> but we're, we're also proud that we were the major builder of Heritage Park. Mm -hmm. And we stood by that development uh, in some, through some tough times. Copeland Trucking. Yes. Uh, so uh, I grew up in a mom and pop trucking business over south. My mom ran it. My dad worked at the post office. Mm -hmm. And... Um, um, then uh, it went. It went. I had started Thor Construction. Then f f five years later, it went bankrupt, and I bought the license and two broke down trucks for my dad. And now we have over a hundred power units, two hundred trailers, and four terminals. Uh, and that's that's the small business. Thor, as you well yeah. know, is a um, um, in, uh, international construction company, perhaps maybe the largest in the country. Your company is one of the largest black businesses in the country, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And so how's it feel? Pinch me. <laughs> it doesn't feel real. I mean, you know, I'm an ops guy. And so, uh, you know, Ravi's the visionary mm -hmm. and um, has taken us places I could never take the company. Mm -hmm. But I'm an ops guy, so I deal with the nuts and bolts and the problems. And so... Um, um, that's, that's, so, that's where my, so my uh, people motivated you. You had people that sort of opened your eyes <coughs> and gave you the idea that something greater was possible, as you've described, Ravi. But yes. you mentioned before the great uh, brother Beck Horton. Absolutely. How yeah. did he influence your life? Well, you know, who was he? Tell people. So Beck Horton was the first, uh, well, not the first. Archie Givens was the first black millionaire in Minnesota. Uh, and, and, and an inspiration as a kid because I grew up in the neighborhood where he was <laughs> building those homes over mm -hmm, south. Mm -hmm. uh, but then back as an adult, Beck was really on the map building, um, you know, Juno, and mm -hmm. and he had uh, Microtron, uh, Microtron mm -hmm. over on the north side, 
And uh, that was one of the first big moving jobs we ever had was consolidating Microtron. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so Ann Beck was a personal friend of mine yep. and a mentor. And so I, I've got to acknowledge on the shoulders that I stand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brother Houston, uh, you know, when you listen to uh, elders, uh, masters, I call them, uh, like uh, Brother Richard Copeland, entrepreneurs, what does it mean to you and where do you see yourself going? What's your vision? You know, it means everything to me. I'm, I'm from Mississippi, so I'm a village kid. Um, I was raised by um, folks who believed in self-sufficiency, right, do for self. So the community that I grew up in, um, my grandmothers lived on opposite ends of the street, right? And so all of their children populated the rest of the street. And so I had um, from woodsmiths to carpenters, um, drywall tradesmen, uh, painters, preachers, you name it, um, clothiers. And so for me, this reinforces everything that needed to be done everything was doable be done. We grew and being done in your community. And, you know, had to work and work ethic and. I remember complaining about it when I was a little boy, like, this ain't fair, it's the summer, I'm supposed to be able to go and play like everyone else, and they told me, this is gonna pay off, it's gonna make you uh, a juggernaut when you get older, and it has. Mm -hmm. So being in the company of, of these gentlemen and seeing their success, right, it reinforces the value of hard work and all those things that was instilled in me as a, as a, as a young boy. It's full circle, right, work ethic, integrity, mentors, uh, we need <coughs> guidance, no matter what, I always tell, Guys my age, look, the, one of the best things you can do is go sit on the porch with someone who has wisdom and just listen. Mm -hmm. you so know? you were in the barber business, among other things, mm -hmm. and that's where we listen that's where historically we listen. in our yeah. community. Absolutely. And so talk about that, how that unfolds in HMMR, in so, the men's room. So, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, 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 a big believer in, you know, um, like sharing, sharing space. And so... Um, I always encourage clients to come in and let's just talk, whatever you want to talk about, right? From golf to marriage to whatever it is. And, you know, it's something about that space. I always talk about the barbershop being one of the only places where black men from all socioeconomic backgrounds will converge. Yeah. Yeah. The little homie on the street yeah. meets Barack Obama. They all yeah. got to get here. Come. Yeah. And so, so it's <clears throat> when you when you open up and you're sharing, and a guy could just be talking about an issue he's having around getting housing. I remember I learned leverage in the barbershop. I was talking about buying a hundred twenty-five thousand dollar house. Old gentleman said, well, "Look, well, what can you afford? You're young. Why don't you buy a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house? You're gonna sell it in three years anyway. Look at the difference in terms of what you're gonna walk. You know, I'm like, and he walked me backwards hmm. uh, by just talking, right? So you never know when you start to open up and share. Someone can pull you to the side and say, well, you know." Here's, here's another way of looking at that. And, and, and so we've, we've took that space that one of the first commercial spaces, a lot of folks don't know in 1800s, 13 of the richest black men in America were barbers because white men didn't do service work, right? And, they, and a lot of them bought their freedom. So it's this, this basin of, of entrepreneurship that, that I don't think computers or anything will ever be able to replace for us. Um, and and we, we're building on that and that's where the, the brand Black Excellence came from because, um, you know, for me... I'm seeing that all around the country now. It's everywhere. You started it. Yes, sir. Talk about it. You know, it started with uh, a lot of the young, young, young guys coming in the shop um, and a lot of them came with the head down and they had a lot of uh, negative uh, viewpoints of each other, of themselves, of the history. I mean, some of the, the self-hate, right, the stereotypes that they were perpetuating, I'm like, what's going on here? And philando happened. And, you know... Um, Break that down. The philando Castile yep. murder, um, a, you know, young, young black man who was perceived as a threat, right, because of how he looks. Whatever was going on in that car, that officer was escalated because of reasons that were deep. And, and so... For me, it's like, I don't want to play defense anymore. I want to play offense. And our offense is, if I'm walking around with black X's on my chest, it begs the viewer of this to question, what does that mean? And it also, um, whether a young, young man or woman is wearing it, 
they walk with it. You know, like the movie Black Panther's out, so that pride, you know, Wakanda forever. This is kind of like a Wakanda statement in that it's a, it's a statement of pride. So Greg, how do we change the narrative? There's this perception that we've lived with over the past generation that continually uh, diminishes the dignity, the value of black life. Black lives have not mattered and uh, our society was flippant. But I think there's a sea change now. I think what you mentioned in the film Black Panther and many more things, the work that we're doing around this table uh, reflects a major change in consciousness, awareness. And the object, therefore, I believe, Greg Cunningham, is to change the narrative. How do we do that? We're, how are we making that happen? I think it is happening. And I'm, I'm an optimist um, by, by nature, Al. And you know, I think things like the film uh, Black Panther and the things that Mr. Houston is doing in, in our community, I, I sense um, a true pivot moment happening in, in our community. And I think the core of it is around entrepreneurship um, because entrepreneurship allows us to have self-determination, um, self-empowerment, self-liberation. Um, and I think there's a role for businesses and corporations in that. Um, and I think our role is to help enable that. Um, because vibrant communities are good business for everybody. Um, and most people don't work in corporate America. Um, employment um, gaps begin to close when you have more successful small businesses. Um, and so, because that's where the job creation happens. And we are our people. Yes. We are our folks. And that's true of everybody. Yeah, sure, you know, sure. and, and, and I think, you know, you can't have vibrant communities if people aren't working. And so for me, it, it continues to be around how do we continue as, as a corporation and, and uh, the private sector um, be able to support um, small businesses and entrepreneurs and allow that to happen. The other part of it is the cultural shift. And I think that's where things like the films and we're starting to see black artists and musicians and film directors um, who are much more um, responsible in the type of content um, that we see coming out um, and being rewarded. Right? And so putting pressure on the system, uh, when, you, when you think of things like the Academy Awards and how our voices <laughs> helped to really shape and change. I mean, there were three black films, I think, nominated for Best Picture last year, and one of them won, right? Because diversity is not having one picture, right? To say, you know, the Best Picture category, you got one film. Well, that ain't diversity, and, let's, and that one ain't gonna win. You know, we, we, we reach that point of, that tipping point when there's three films that are considered, or if you have um, positions opening in your company and you're trying to hire for significant positions, well, it's not about having one person of color as a candidate. You need to have three, right? So, um, you know, I think that's where we have some responsibility. That's where I think the narrative is changing, Al, is how we define, you know, what that looks like for us and how we have collective responsibility around self-determination and self-empowerment. Richard, I uh, reached out to you when you were about to start building uh, the property on Plymouth and Penn and uh, asked, would it be okay for Insight News to do a series of stories? And since that time, we've hired an architect, Randall Bradley, to chronicle the development of the corner of Plymouth and Penn, focusing right now on Thor, but also writing about the Estes uh, funeral and, and uh, crematory. Uh, services and eventually he'll talk about the development of North Point. Right. So documentation is important. One of the problems is that too often much of what we do we don't know about. Uh, that is hidden from us. Maybe we allow it or maybe it's not intentional but as often as not our people don't have the sense of what we are capable of and it seems to me that part of the narrative changing we're talking about is the need to be intentional in communicating, telling our story, creating a record that we manage and reflects our sense of who we are, where we've been, where we're going. What do you think about that? Well, you're absolutely right, Al. And uh, I haven't probably done a good enough job on chronicling my 40 years in business. <laughs> Uh, but some young, bright people now that work for Thor are doing that and taking it seriously. And they talk about my legacy, which I never even really thought about. I just got up, put one foot in front of the other, and did what I said I was going to do, and showed up all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's, it's, it's taken on a life of its own, and it's much more, as you just pointed out, than I ever thought it would be. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, I'm learning, too. <laughs> <laughs> History, uh, your family, what's this, the sense of entrepreneurship? Your dad and mom owned the business. What about before them? What's your family roots? So uh, the family roots. My father was a porter on the train mm -hmm. uh, from Chicago, 
uh, was uh, working for the Rock Island. That's how he got here. Mm -hmm. That's how word used to travel. And uh, uh, Tila, Tila Burt wrote, uh, so Tila Burt uh, lived about 105, mm -hmm. and he was a, a real estate agent. And he rode the train, told my dad, uh, Minneapolis is the promised land. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so my, my father started checking out. My, my mother was a realtor for Tila Burt mm -hmm. back in the 50s. And uh, that's how those two met. Your background, Greg, family well, background. Family background. I grew up in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. um, Pennsylvania, and so I was really, uh, you know, as, as you guys were talking, like you could almost see the images as you were talking about, you know, our neighborhoods. And, you know, I grew up um, in the late 60s in, in Pittsburgh. My dad was a butcher, um, took over the business from a Jewish man, owned the butcher shop, and my dad worked there from the time he was 13. And when the riots happened after the assassination of Martin Luther King, which is celebrating the 50th, um, 50th year this year, um, when the riots happened, um, the Jewish man gave the business to my dad. Um, and so I grew up in a community where I don't think I saw a white person until I was 10. You know, well, maybe wow. not that, maybe I was six, but because everything we needed was in our community. You know, from the barbershop to my dad was the butcher to the restaurants, to where we, you know, there was this sense of, of community. And the only time we went downtown is if my mom wanted to go to the department store. That's amazing. So my family, my dad and mom owned the grocery store as well. Wow. Uh, my dad uh, taught me, I was a butcher by the age of like 12, 13. Wow. I was a butcher. And my mother spoke Yiddish. Wow. She got the business from a Jewish guy that she worked for. So there same story. So Mississippi, talk about that. And my mom's from Mississippi too and my wife's from there, so that means a lot to me. Talk, that, you know, for me, your... like, um, so I was born in 78, uh -huh. and I always say we, I was on that, that, the last ones that really got it, mm -hmm. right? My, my grandfather was a, uh, he was a sugarcane farmer, yeah. and so our Saturday snack after we would shell uh, bushels of peas, right? Like, that's what we had to do, was a stalk of sugarcane. So I was that kid, right? And, and, and my grandmother, who, these, these folks were resourceful. She had all of her kids and grandchildren bring back the Spam cans, and she took them, wrapped them in cushion. She sewed little fancy um, uh, ruffles around them, and she sold them at churches as pin cushions for the mothers. And wow. So uh, it was just rich with um, that can do, will do. Uh, it's always enough kind of spirit, and it was just f you know, full of love, always felt. Like, you know, I was, I was capable and I was held accountable. And so, um, you know, there, there, there are things that I'm, I'm recalling now as a 39-year-old man that things that were put in me as a, as a young boy that, that uh, I'll never forget. You know, I, I don't yet have children, but I'll say this, I'll take them to Mississippi every summer mm -hmm. because I think it's something about uh, that, that air, that country, folks greeting each other, yes, ma'am, no, sir. Um, just this kind of, of, of rites of passage, if you will, that's necessary for, for to be a really productive and understanding member of our community, right? Like, and, and to know that we can do for self. Mm -hmm. You have to see it in, in, in not just one or two, but a community. So, so how do you not be discouraged by the negative uh, description of who we are from outside? Too often the daily uh, press and daily media sort of paint us in the most negative and horrific light. And if we are not careful, we end up ingesting and further acting out in ways that uh, validate that incorrect assessment. How do you resist that and demonstrate the difference? I push back with imagery, right? I push back um, um, with, um, you know, social media is, is, a, is a great tool <laughs> these days, which is why I like to go live and ask certain questions, which, as Richard was alluding to, he's learning. And I've learned now that we have power and we can control the narrative. So I'm always on the offense. I don't post anything negative. I don't respond to negativity. And so I'm always on this can do, can do, can do. And I think it's infectious. I think you're saying community is possible. I want to thank my guest, uh, Greg Cunningham. Thank you, Vice President, Global Inclusion and Diversity at US Bank, Richard Copeland, owner uh, and chairman of Thor Companies, uh, building uh, a what I think 
is a major work in our community. But you've done it right with the stadium. You've done this in, around the world. But right now, this is in our neighborhood, and it means so much more. And uh, Brother uh, Houston White, HMMR, thank you. Speaking of history, let's have uh, my brother, Wayne McFarland, talk about the South. Wayne? Well, I remember stories that my mama told me. She's growing up in Mississippi. She used to live down by a sunflower, pick up all the green, had a bale of cotton, and work was hard, so it seemed. Well, I remember she told me once a story how the man told her they got to get off the bus. Slave man told her that if you don't get off the bus right here, I'm going to throw you in the river, throw you in the river over there. That was a story our mama told us uh, when, uh, when we were young about her and Aunt R.T. Mm -hmm. riding a Greyhound bus from uh, Mississippi coming to Minnesota. They were Kansas, Kansas, Kansas City, City, Missouri. And they was on a bus, and these two the driver and some other people says, y'all black women can't be on the bus. They didn't say women, they said other words mm -hmm. and, and called these children out. And they were like 15 and they were young. But anyway, those are the stories that our mom and they, when, when we get, when I got older, I now I finally get to play her songs. I played my father's songs from Jamaica for the last 40 years. So now this is my next 40. Wayne, thank you. Mississippi goddamn. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be back in a minute. I'm Al McFarland, you're watching Conversations with Al McFarland. Thank you. Yes, sir. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Hey, one no. Oh, you want to be? Who right, who right, who right, who right? Well, we all fall down. So we all fall down. So we all fall down. Sometimes. Fighting, learning to love one another, join together tonight, no matter in the stormy weather. Our mission is to inform, instruct, and inspire. And I know we'll get you going, and we will light the fire. Good afternoon, and welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. And thank you, Wayne McFarland. I'm Al McFarland. Welcome to Conversations with Al McFarland. We continue our discussion with black business owners, proprietors, entrepreneurs. And uh, the first part of the program, giants in the business, plus uh, one of our, uh, I think, uh, visionary corporate executives talking about this history, the propensity of our people to think about being self-reliant, mm. self-sufficient. I want to continue this part of the program by talking to practitioners, uh, men and women who are in the field, and particularly younger men and women who have decided that they must control, that you must control your own destiny. So here with me is Christer, Christopher Webley. He's president and CEO of New Rules. He studied textile technology with a concentration in medical textiles at North Carolina State University. He's worked with Calvin Klein with Victoria's Secret and Target. And he's uh, you know, just built a body of experience in retail fashion industry and also as a R&D textile engineer. Tommy Beavis is the owner of Pimento Jamaican Kitchen. He learned everything he needed to know about cooking from the warmth of his grandmother's house, her kitchen, uh, from cooking Sunday dinners for the entire family as early as the age of 12. He eventually went on to earn an MBA 
from University of Minnesota, has done corporate work, but now is doing his own business. Uh, the three of us are Jamaicans, and so that's another bond. So we're going to bring in, uh, but our, our African queen, our sister, <laughs> Raisha Williams, is a proud fourth generation black Minnesotan. She walks in a deeply rooted, powerful history. Her grandmother is the celebrated uh, Delia Nevels, and her mother is Rosemary Nevels Williams. They've been advocates and champions for change for communities of color for over 65 years in Minnesota. And uh, Raisha recently opened Heritage Tea House Boutique in Frogtown neighborhood here in St. Paul. Raisha, thank you for being here. Thank you. You and I also traveled to Ghana together. Yes, so we, we both did. have a, an African lineage yes. and African, African names. names. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. here we are together. It's all family. All family. So, but I'm, I'm excited to have you here because I want you to tell your own story about what brought you, what passion drives you, and what your vision is as an entrepreneur, as a business person. Christopher, start with you. Thank you for being here. Uh, yeah, thank you guys for having me. Um, I guess so my story is, is, is very similar to, uh, I think, a lot of the folks at the table. Um, you know, spent time uh, in the corporate sector, um, learned a lot um, in terms of how to run a business, how to scale a business, um, and uh, was laid off when I was at Target um, and decided to follow my passion um, and respond to the calling that God had placed on my heart. Um, and that was uh, leaving some type of legacy um, in the black community um, and, and using economic development as a means to do that. Um, uh, following uh, my departure from Target, um, and thank you to Target, by the way, um, mm -hmm. for, for the opportunity to, mm -hmm. to follow my passion. Um, I, I uh, really wanted to, uh, one, be in a black community where I could identify. Um, and Minnesota, obviously, as a transplant, um, there aren't um, many outlets for us here. Um, and as I began my journey, um, just quickly identified that there were not, uh, there was a lack of resources for uh, black, black and brown people. Um, and took it upon ourselves to, to do something about it. Um, I think, you know, the, the great thing about being an entrepreneur is that, you know, we're the, often the ones solving the, the world's problems. Um, and so we, we started a real estate development company called New Rules. Um, we're focused on taking the community's feedback, um, using components of design thinking and delivering on what they asked for. Um, so back in 2015, we acquired a 4,000 multi um, complex um, in North Minneapolis um, and brought the community in and said, hey, what do you guys want to see in the community? Uh, we identified some of the problems, but mostly focused on prototyping solutions uh, for how we could utilize the space. Um, out of that feedback um, session, folks shared their needs for financial resources, uh, space to be black and, and be proud. Um, economic and development opportunities, places to network uh, with folks who are like-minded. And so out came this concept of a shared workspace, mm -hmm. retail and event space concept. They call it co-working now, right, too? Co-working. Or not, same, same difference or not? I would say very different. Okay. Um, our space is more of a, a maker's hub. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the, the practitioners who, who utilize our space mm -hmm. are, are in the creative and small business space. Um, the goal was to bring those two sectors together in that they enable each other. Um, I had this hunch of, you know, no matter what type of business you're trying to start, you're always going to need a photographer, a videographer, um, and some, a web developer. And so the idea was to centralize those mm -hmm. people in one space um, and provide them with resources. In the black community, um, traditionally, you know, we don't have the, the startup capital to go mm -hmm. buy a camera or a lens or a computer and software. And so we provide that for our members. Mm -hmm. um, that's on a sliding scale, month to month membership. Um, and you can sort of think of it in terms of a vertically integrated system where you make, market, and produce all on site. Um, so we have an event space where people can uh, do pop ups, mm -hmm. uh, we do birthday parties, art galleries, we have yoga class every Thursday, community dinners, um, disguise the lemon. And, and then we're we're currently ramping up our retail um, division where uh, we're looking to serve as a distributor for, for artists and groups. So um, again, you think about yourself as a musician, as a fashion designer, getting your product to market is often like the biggest challenge. Um, so we have a hunch that if we could uh, centralize those creative forces and, and, do, and take off 
take on their marketing and promotions for them. How, how do you capitalize your businesses? This is for all of you. How do you uh, either use your money or family and friends or go to the marketplace to acquire the resources you need? Do you have investors? Uh, is it loans? How do you start this business? Uh, well, so I think we got started like most black businesses get started. We bootstrapped mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and pulled it out of our, our, our pockets. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I tapped into, you know, my life savings, spent all of it uh, on getting mm -hmm. the business started. Um, and there's, there's honestly never enough money to do the work. Um, but we've, we've done it in the incremental stages. We've, we started with the bare necessities to get started. Um, and as we've evolved over the last two years almost, um, the space has evolved as a, as a result. So as we make money, we reinvest it back into the space to continue to build the business. Raisha, what's the story of your business, um, at the Heritage Tea House Boutique? So um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, you know, uh, entrepreneurship is in my blood. My mother and grandmother were uh, one of the few African-American florists in the Twin Cities, and they had a brick and mortar on 38th and Nicollet um, as I was growing up. And so all through my middle school, all the way up to high school years, I'd have to go there after school and Saturdays and work. And so I think that was sort of the seed of black woman um, ownership and freedom. We weren't wealthy. We didn't make a killing. But my mom was able to provide a quality life for her children and, and also take us to Africa, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so um, I saw that as an opportunity to, to really have my own. And, and I could believe that I could have my own because it was already presented before me. Uh, what I, the reason why I opened up Heritage Tea House is because I have a vision to create Hollywood in the hood, right? And so it's like my little saying, I want to create this space where, uh, where African Americans and people of color um, are valued and honored and respected and, and their customer service experiences of the highest quality level. Uh, prior to opening up the tea house, I opened up a spa service on Broadway um, that was called the Lash Bar. And when people walked in, they'd be like, oh my God, this feels like I'm in Uptown. And I'm like, exactly. We deserve to have the highest quality um, aesthetics, quality of service and products uh, uh, in our community. And so that's my vision, to create that. What we did with the tea house is that we merged three business concepts into one, which is a really popular thing to do, and New Rules does this a lot, and Tommy has started to do this with his business venture. But we took an um, a African cultural boutique, so we sell African, African-American merchandise, mm -hmm. um, and we took a restaurant and tea, and then we also took entertainment space. And so we combined them into one to be a Heritage Tea House Boutique. Okay. Yeah. Tommy, jump in. Y your story. Yeah. Um, so... Born and raised Kingston, Jamaica, of course, similar story to Raisha. Uh, I'm from a family of entrepreneurs, and so um, with Pimento's growth, I might become the third generation to create a million dollar company. Um, you know, so it's really. So cool. millionaires are in your family. <laughs> yeah, in <the> <laughs> Kingston yeah. millionaires. <laughs> okay. Okay. Kingston okay. millionaires, that's right. Um, <laughs> and, um, but after um, going to university and you know um, going into the corporate responsibility space, I enjoyed it. I had the dream job of, of, of managing global programs that are helping to feed people around the world, educate people around the world, and protect our environment at the same time. And so I'd leave that wonderful job um, every day and go home. At, and at Cargill, great company. At Cargill, love yeah. Cargill, yeah. yeah. And then I'd leave Cargill every day um, and go home and tired and drained. And I'm like, what am I going to do to de-stress? I'd fire up the grill mm -hmm. because that was my way to connecting back home, mm -hmm. you know. So I'd throw on some jerky and the entire neighborhood would smell like the neighbors would come over. And that's how we literally got started. So the neighbors would come over. Yoni, my business partner, um, was literally next door. And we were like, you know what, let's um, test this market. So we took my grill from my backyard on a $100 tent and started in a Bryn Mawr garage sale where we gave away the food free because we didn't know how people were going to respond in right. Minnesota to Jamaican food. Right. Um, and in exchange, people signed on to our social media campaign and gave us their feedback. And from there, we just started learning a lot about the culture, um, particularly like boneless chicken. It doesn't, you'll never find a boneless chicken running around in Jamaica, but the Minnesotans <laughs> said they wanted it, so we figured out how to offer them that as well. Um, so we started with literally, as you're talking about bootstrapping, on the ground with my tent, washing pans on the street of Minneapolis, um, you know, at Uptown Art Fair and all these smaller events. 
Um, fast forward later, a year, we won a Food Network reality mm -hmm. show, Food Court Wars, got our first space free for a year, um, got some startup capital. Um, and then I was still doing Cargill 60 hours, 40 hours at Pimento every single week. Mm -hmm. Then um, then after a year of it proving um, its profitability, I recognized that it needed to grow and the best way for it to grow was for me to step away. Mm -hmm. And so um, as painful as it might have been, my, it was certainly a calling, as Chris said, um, to be able to step away, um, to go focus on growing and building legacy um, and so, so so what's the message Chris for you uh, and for our community I, I number one I when I first read read about new rules the name itself I thought was audacious I mean it's just amazing that you have the uh, uh, the strength the vision and the confidence to say you know what I make the rules these are new rules I, I love that and so what are you saying what are we saying to both ourselves and to the universe, to our community, in, in this energy that we're investing. Yeah, um, uh, so the name uh, choice was very intentional, um, partly because of the, the, the location, geographic location of where we're at in Minneapolis, um, uh, but also too, just where we're at as society, right? Um, I think we've traditionally, um, you know, we expect a different outcome um, we say we want more black businesses. We say we want more black people to thrive in Minnesota, um, but we're still taking the same process to, to get a different outcome. Um, and with my background being in engineering, you know, if you're taking the same input, you're always gonna get the same output. Um, and so New Rules was an um, intentional effort to disrupt the status norm of, of what we deem acceptable. Um, new Rules is all about not necessarily breaking the rules. We we're pushing leaders and, and folks in the community to think it differently about how we engage with each other. You know, Raisha and Tommy and I were all talking, you know, when we came in, like even the concept of supporting each other, you know, that's a, a new thing that we're trying to push. Uh, we're trying to model new behaviors, ultimately. Um, we, we're, we're to get a different outcome, you have to do something different. So that's what New Rules is all about. And Raisha, you mean, you, you reflect uh, this in all areas of accountability and responsibility. You ran for public office. I did. And it was a major campaign. Yeah, And you did was. great. Thank you. You didn't win. Thank you. But your presence yeah. was felt. Yeah. And your voice was heard. Yeah. And you've uh, invited other young people and other women and other black women to say, you know what? My voice matters. Yeah. And come to the table and, yeah. and be a part of it. Um, I have to piggyback off of what Chris was saying, though. I think that one of the beauties of being a new business owner in the Twin Cities is that, that yes, you, you sometimes feel like I need more support, but then I always want to recognize those who do. And so it's been nothing but love from Tommy at Pimento. And think, people think, oh, two black restaurants can exist. And we have to get beyond that because we don't do that. We don't stigmatize those type of businesses in the Latino community or the Asian community. You know, they're able to have multiple businesses on the same street same, serving the same, same food. Same and yeah. and they all are making money. And mm -hmm. so it's been such an honor to have so Stephanie at Golden Time. What is it in our community? What that is does it that? in our history that makes us uh, sort of uh, uh, be afraid to trust each other, to know each other, to engage and support each other? I, I know it comes out of our yeah. slave experience, but talk about that. Well, you know, and I have and, to. And, and the I, path beyond that as well. Yep. Yeah. And I have to, and I want to finish saying yeah. that I have to give honor and, and respect to Stephanie at Golden Time, mm -hmm. who's been amazing and supportive mm -hmm. to us being right up the street from them and sort of servicing the same mm -hmm. uh, customer base. But I, you know, I think it's, I think it's, we, we, you know, I think it's, we have to talk about white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. And what that means mm -hmm. and how that is overall arching. It's, it's a theory and it's an ideal ideology that's trickled down to our community. And we've bought into this ideal that we can't have if the other has, right? Mm -hmm. Only one of us can be great. It's also part of this talented 10th theory, right? So only a few will make it out. Only a few will be great. And I've always dismissed that theory. I always felt like looking at other models and other communities, they all survived. You take a look at the Somali community who came out of a, 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 a war and a war-torn country and still is going through that. But in the Twin Cities and, uh, and nationally, they have thrived because they work together, right? Mm -hmm. And they're supporting one another. And so I think that if we continue to model what that looks like, Tommy, Chris, and I all supporting each other. Houston, who was on the, 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 the 
discussion earlier, constantly supporting each other and, and being out in public, supporting each other. Sammy at Avenue Eatery comes to the tea house all the time, makes posts about it. I go to his business and support it. I think if we display that type of bond and support, everybody else will get on the bad wagon. If we start to show the positive uh, attribute to supporting one another and not focus so much on the negative, mm -hmm. publicly, right, we can have our arguments in, behind mm -hmm. closed doors, but publicly showing that we can support each other, I think that we'll continue to grow like we are doing. Mm -hmm. Tommy, what do you think? I think that latter part, though, answers your question about the path out of it. It's about inspiring and encouraging others to be as brave as we've been, mm -hmm. uh, to step forward and build their own empires. Mm -hmm. You know, so you're, you're, you're spot on on that, you know, so um, from time to time, we, any time we get a chance to um, connect with our community or speak to kids, the younger generation, it is important that we're there because of that same path of encouraging them to do the same. I think expectation is so important. And you talked about uh, following the path of generations mm -hmm. that have been successful entrepreneurs. You talked about being uh, the beneficiary of a mom and grandmom who were entrepreneurs in the community. So this is a path that's not unusual for you. And what you're doing is not anything that you've seen as so daunting that it was impossible to even dream that way. I think you have the same feeling. You sort of have this sort of, I think, uh, my impression of you, Chris, is that you have a, um, uh, a very matter of fact, low key <laughs> confidence that is simply unstoppable. I could be wrong. I don't know you well, but the vibe I'm getting from you is I know that, him well. You're spot on. Okay. He's chill, but he's, he's that, got something going on. Yeah, that it. you yeah. are just in it and you own it all day. And it reflects something that you know about who you are and who we are. And my job as a communicator is to say, you know what? I know that you are right. And my job is to make sure that all of us have the same knowledge and that we all experience uh, the inspiration and the, uh, get the instruction. Uh, that we need to move forward. What do you think? No, I, I, I think you're spot on. Um, I'm in an unwavering place of peace right now. Wow. Um, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I, lo what I love. I'm in a community surrounded by black and brown people who look just like me. I'm sitting at a table with, with folks who embody the same values that I, that I have as well. Um, so I, I, I think we're at a, at a very crucial point in time in history um, that, that one, as a, as a black community, we've never had this much uh, education. We've never had this much spending power. Um, and so I think we're at a, at a crucible where we can go left or right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, having Raisha and Tommy and, and folks at the table um, to continue to model these new behaviors, I think we can really spark some change in the Twin Cities. What, what does your Jamaican-ness mean to your attitude uh, about being a, 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 uh, an entrepreneur? Uh, um, it means a, a whole lot. Because mm -hmm. if you think about it, most immigrants and most foreigners, um, they're from countries where um, you don't have the large corporations hiring a million people. And so you have to go out there and do it for yourself. Um, and so I think innately we recognize that we have to go build our own empires. But also another portion of that too is coming from a, a com country like Jamaica, you're used to seeing black doctors, you're used to seeing black prime ministers, mm -hmm. you're used to seeing, you know, and, and so it, it's not as daunting because you're like, yeah, of course, I'm, it is meant to be, um, it is who I am, you know, and so, um, and so it, it, it gives us a, big, a greater confidence because we don't have that much for lack of a better term, oppression that have told us we can't mm -hmm. because we had to for all, for all those generations before. Yeah. I think to piggyback off of what Tommy was saying, um, you know, being from Jamaica, you know, uh, there, there's those who have it and, and those who don't, and there's a lot on, of folks in the island who don't. Um, and so, you know, having AC, having running water, like those things are a luxury to me. Hot water. Um, you know, it's a, it's a luxury. <laughs> Um, and so, you know, in that entrepreneurial space now, it's like, uh, I, I, I don't need much to, to survive. Uh, I don't need the extra things that society has told me that I need. I don't need the, the flashy car and the flashy watch. Like, I'm, I'm at peace with what I have. And so I think where I'm at now is wanting to, to pass the legacy back to continue to share what, I, what my experience is and pass that back to the, to the next generation. And you mentioned uh, you you uh, sort of praised the Somali community, mm -hmm. the African immigrant community for building and operating with a sense of cohesiveness that is producing results. So the question is, how do we, who are first or second or third generation of uh, Africans 
in America uh, by dint of the slave trade uh, mobilize and move forward? I think we have. We have. We always have. But the problem is that the information environment that's outside of us has attempted to dispel the truth of our movement, certainly among them, but to the degree that some of us end up taking that and thinking that what they're saying it's is true, true Absolutely. when it is not. And so how do we keep fighting yeah. that so that our voices come through strong and clear and our work is both evident and predictive of our success? Well, woo, that's a good, that's a loaded question, but that's good. Uh, the reality of it is, is that we've had Black Wall Street, right? And so African Americans have already done this. And we just have to, number one, take a look at what that looked like and how that existed. And you're absolutely right. It has been intentionally destroyed. A lot of that information was not documented. And if it was, it was hidden deep down in records. And so we just have to make an intentional research effort to go see what that looked like, right? How, did, how was that model? How was that created? And then we model, but we build off of what we already know to be preexistent. I think that, um, you know, like both Tommy and Chris have said, I started with nothing. I mean, I started with faith, literally, and had a lease and no money, but knew that I was going to open up a restaurant. And so I had to do a lot of the, the labor myself in my restaurant. And you can't be afraid to do that, right? I mean, no one's going to come and save you. You have mm -hmm. to get in there and you have to do it yourself. And I, I think I was a little bit more pritzy about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, OK, I, I built it out. It's here. Now I'm going to hire a manager, and they're going to come in right. and manage this thing. And probably about three weeks in, it was chaotic. And mm. my mom sat me down and said, listen, you, this is your 9 to 5, 9 to 10, 10 to 2. You're going to be in there every day. Yep. And so um, I think that since I've gotten in there, I've been able to then say, OK, what's working, what's not working? And we can't be afraid to do that, right? Like, we have to be prepared to do the work on all turns because, unfortunately, we don't have the financial capital. I didn't have a whole bunch of working capital where I could hire a whole bunch of staff, which would have been nice, and then I could have figured it out. Like, I had to be the staff. I have to be the marketing director. I have to be the, the dishwasher. bus, the dishwasher, <laughs> yeah. which I'm oftentimes mm -hmm. always pouting about. But I have to do it. And the business is growing, and it's becoming successful. We're down to the last minute. I want to ask you all, because you're all kind of millennials or close to millennials, about uh, the impact of this notion of um, Black Panther. I think that's kind <laughs> of a <laughs> cultural game changer. Do you agree or not? Is there something of value? Have you seen the movie yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what Twice. You, what, what, okay, well, <laughs> me too. So give, give me what it means to uh, this time, and how do you use the discussion uh, to move forward? Yeah, I, you know, to piggyback off of Raisha, what she was saying earlier, I, I think we have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I think that's the, the underlying theme. Like, it's, it's not convenient uh, to want to reach back and, and, and have patience with our, with our people. Mm -hmm. um, I think Black Panther showed us that that one, our, our buying power and spending power is one of the highest grossing you know, movies of all time. Um, so I think that in itself shows us what we can do as a community if we, if we intentionally rally together and band together um, you know, through, through these times. Um, I, the other piece that Black Panther is, it just, it serves as a source of inspiration. Um, you know, it, was, it was a piece of, of, of pride, you know, to see all, to go into a movie theater and, and see only black people um, there. So, Tommy, quick, I, I quickly. think uh, the piece that I think that stands out for me is it reminds us that we're all from Wakanda. We all have Wakanda within us, and it's just a matter of us harnessing that greatness that is innately within us. Yeah, and Tommy and I actually we, went saw, to the, we saw it together, and I saw it twice. I saw it without him, and then again, him and his lovely wife. But I, yes, so we sell African clothing in our in our, our boutique. And it is so surprising how many young people of uh, blacks who come in and and brothers who you would know you know would never wear daishiki are coming in and they're purchasing. We're sold out of daishikis, uh, and that's a beautiful thing yeah. because it's recreated pride mm -hmm. and like our ownership of the motherland in Africa, and that's a part of us and our culture. So that's it's a beautiful thing. We're, it's starting that new resurgence of the '60s and '70s of black power, black pride, and hopefully this time we won't make it so daunting where we allow it to be destroyed and we, we keep evolving it. I think redemption is at hand. How about redemption song, Wayne McFarland? <laughs> Thank you all so much. This is a great conversation. Uh, Raisha Williams, uh, Brother Tommy Beavis, and Brother Christopher Webley. Thank you all so much. Keep up the good work. Oop.
pirates, yes, they're robbing. So lied to the merchant ships. Moments after the woman took a hand from the bottomless pit. But my hands were made stronger by the hands of the Almighty. And we fired this generation triumphantly. Won't you help me shine? These songs of freedom is all I ever had. Redemption song. Conversations with Al McFarland is brought to you by U.S. Bank. Thank you, Wayne. I'm Al McFarland. This is Conversations with Al McFarland. We'll see you next time. That was it. <laughs> I'm just a cowboy. I'm going to come into your town. Every time I see you, you make my heart go wild. Every time you kiss me, you make me want to smile. It's all right, it's okay. I want to be the special lover of the day. want to be your cowboy, please.